Welcome to the Rocky Top Roundtable. I'm Austin Price, joined by Eric Kane, Rob Lewis, and Brent Hubbs. It's Florida week, which means the first trip to Gainesville in two years, which means first road game of the year, which means first SEC game, which means a lot of anxious ball fans because Tennessee is the favorite heading into this game. Yeah, it's unusual. Tennessee's in a place they're not normally at as a favorite, and I don't think, I think Tennessee fans are a little more uh, nervous about this one. Rob, based on what happened to Tennessee last week, I think they would have questions regardless of how Tennessee played against Austin P. But with the offense where it's been through the first two weeks, I think it creates a little more nervousness. Yeah, I think if Tennessee had rolled straight to Gainesville from Nashville you know, after they played Virginia, I think fans would have been a, a little more confident, a little more cocky. But you know, putting 30 points on, on Austin P, not scoring their first touchdown until you know a minute before halftime, Joe Milton's inaccuracy down the field, and the house of horrors that is the swamp lumen, it's. You can see why, you know, Tennessee fans are, have, have a little trepidation this week. Eric, let's talk about Joe Milton. Um, it just hasn't been on point through two weeks. Um, and then the receivers haven't helped him out when he has put it uh, in, in a catchable spot. Yeah, it's kind of, been, uh, kind of been weird to watch because we heard so many good things about Joe Milton, but also the receivers and Dante Thornton and how this group's really come together. And so far through two games, we haven't seen it click. Now, to your point, yeah, I mean, Joe was inaccurate. Joe did not have a good game against Austin P. But, boy, those receivers did not help him whatsoever. Four drops, a couple other balls that they could have caught. And for Tennessee to win in Gainesville, and for Tennessee to win and accomplish what it wants to accomplish this year, that's got to, you know, come around. It's got to come around in a hurry. Yeah, and I think for Tennessee, Austin, the biggest thing, you know, everybody talks about keys to the game and this, that, and the other. I think it's those first couple of drives. How does Joe Milton and, and this receiving core play the first couple of drives? Because if you're off a little bit and, and you go three and out, you go three and out, do you get the here they go again? And yep. coaches suddenly shrink the playbook and what they're willing to call. I think it's really important that Tennessee gets out of the gates here. I'm not saying they got to score, but they've got to they've got to move the football early in this game. I think just have something that gives you some confidence, yeah. right? Uh -huh. I mean, just kind of get a little confidence, even if you don't score. Um, it gives you confidence for drive two and drive three and, 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 and go from there. Also, Rob, his best friend, could be the running game and Jalen Wright, who's averaging near 10 yards a carry through the first two weeks. Yeah, and, and so I, I get why fans are you know, up in arms over the passing game. I really do. But I, I also think that this run game is more set up to help the passing game for the offense to lean on it than it has been in, in Josh's first two years here. You mentioned Jalen Wright. I think he's clearly head and shoulders been Tennessee's best back, averaging a you know ridiculous nine nine point one yards a carry through two games. But overall, the the ground game has been good, even without Cooper May. So you know I realize it's still a bit of a question mark this week. But as a team, averaging six yards a carry, I, I think that's been a real bright spot. What's the realistic number of carries for Jalen Wright? I know they've not used him as much the first two weeks. I've you know didn't have to, but I mean in this kind of game, you feel like he's got to get a lot more. Yeah, someone put on the Monday Night Chat. 18 carries over under. I think no matter what, you need over 18 touches for Jalen Wright. And they're throwing the football to the running backs, uh, kind of you know dumb down, calling some some swing passes and everything. So you need a whole lot of Jalen Wright in this football game. Um, as Rob pointed out, clearly the best running back you have, and so you hope that he's touching the football loss and around 20 times so to help out that offense, especially if the passing game struggling. Well, and here's the question that I have: How is Florida defensively going to attack Tennessee? Are, you know, because the first two teams have now Austin P was more multiple. They they went some some different coverages and did some things and blitzed a little bit. But Virginia basically said, "Hey, we're not going to let you throw it over our head." Does Florida watch the first two games and say, "You know what? We're going to dare you to throw it over yeah. our head," because we're not sure where your passing game is. What we're not going to let you do is we're not going to let you rush for you know, six yards of carry, nine yards of carry if you're Jalen Wright, and we're going to try to take the run game away. I'm going to be interested to see that chess match early in this game. Yeah, and, and Florida, I mean, and what you saw for Florida the first two games doesn't give you a clue because they faced, you know, a backup, backup quarterback in Utah in the opener and then played McNeese last week. So I don't, you, you don't know what the, how they would approach, you know, a balanced offensive attack or an offense where they did have to worry about getting thrown over their head. But I, if, what I saw the first two weeks, I'd be surprised if it's not seven, eight guys in the box. And guys, uh, you know, the flip side is as well, kind of how this defense is attacking Tennessee's offense. For Florida offensively, because Tennessee's first quarter struggles, and it's been one of the best first quarter scoring teams under Josh Hopper the last couple of years, I expect Florida's offense takes some shots down the field, try to get a lead and then run the football if they get that lead and take advantage of these slow starts. So I think it could be a pretty exciting first quarter, and you hope it's exciting for Tennessee because – you know, Tennessee's built to come from behind, don't get me wrong. Florida is not built to come from behind. 
So I think that first quarter is going to be huge. I agree. I, well, that and you just take the – Tennessee gets off to a quick start and you take the, take the crowd out of the game. Because they'll yeah. be lively right out of the gate. But, you know, if it's 14 nothing at the end of the first quarter, how, how deep into the game are they at this point? Because it feels like they're ready to just go, yeah, mm-hmm. we'll, well move on to the next Yeah, person. I mean, they're as unsure about their team as, as, any, as anybody is out sure. there. You know, I mean, Billy Napier's asking for patience and preaching patience and – you know, they're one and one already. They didn't look very good against Utah. They beat a team that everybody was like, you know, a couple a couple big, you know, IMG Academy might have given McNeese a pretty legitimate game, <laughs> you know, down there. What so, about Bishop Sycamore? You know, we're, no. <laughs> I don't know about that one. But, <laughs> well, you know, we'll see. You know, they're just not sure what they have. And, and uh, this, is a, this is a big test. I mean, a lot of people are putting a lot of pressure on Billy Napier on this game because they've got four rivalry games. This one's at home, and this is the, the team right winnable. now that looks yeah. like it's the most winnable for him out of those rival games. Offensively, they, you know they want to run the football. Um, you know, Graham Mertz is more of a, a game manager. And Tennessee's ability to get to the quarterback through the first couple of games has been really, really good. Now, granted, I mean, it's been Virginia and Austin P, but Tennessee's defensive line disruption, even if they've not gotten home, has been really, really good. Yeah, and I think it's got to be big in this game because I, I think what Florida would like to do, obviously they would like to run the, the, run the football. Tennessee's got to win up front and take away the run game. But in the passing game, Rob, they would like to throw the ball in the middle of the field and challenge Tennessee's linebackers, challenge Tennessee's safeties and coverage. Lots of times those routes take a little time to develop. Tennessee's got to get home and not let them get comfortable with some of those over routes and, and longer developing routes over the middle. I think you have to like that matchup a lot for Tennessee when I'm talking about Florida's offensive line versus the front seven slash pass rush. From just based off what we've seen the first two weeks, Florida struggled big time at Utah. Give up five sacks. Mertz was you know, under pressure a, a lot. Tennessee with 11 in, in the first two games. You, you would think this would be the best offensive line they faced, but again, in Florida's one challenge, they did not look good. That, on the road, first game, new offensive coordinator, I, I get it, but, but still, that, that offensive line looked like a question mark before the season for them, and, and the jury's still out. And they get their center back from a high yeah. ankle sprain, which could be interesting, but he's not practiced basically mm-hmm. in six weeks. So where's their continuity in terms of communicating up front? Very much kind of parallels, you know, what, what's happening with Tennessee and Cooper Mays, right? And we'll have to see uh, if he's going to play later on the week. But I was going to say the center, uh, he's going to be a three-year starter. So if he comes back, how effective can he be? But, Rob, to your point, too, the only challenge for Florida so far on the road to Utah – only 13 rushing yards, and this is a team that has got to run the football. So um, I think it sets up well for Tennessee, and I'm intrigued to see what that looks like. The middle eight's been really good to Tennessee the oh, last two weeks, and, and that's a, always a stat that Hubs loves to dive into. Uh, more important, the middle eight in this game, or is it the start? You said the start a minute ago. Do you, do you think it's simply the start? Well, no, I, I think that guy's pivotal, too. Yeah. I think having – him go three for three last week. Was yeah, huge. I, I do. I think, you know, the start's obviously very important because you don't want to be in a bad spot. But how many times in this game, in this rivalry matchup, and I know it's previous coaches and everywhere else, has Florida scored late in the first half, scored early in the second half, and won the middle eight of the football game? I mean, a bunch of times. There's been separation in this game because of what happened right at the end of the first half and the start of the second half. Tennessee's doing that to teams right now. If you can do that, that's huge. It was a big deal last year in this game, right? Yeah. Florida's got a chance to go in with a lead. Here's Tennessee. They convert the, the, the big third down play with Hendon Hooker and the Ramel kind of scramble Keaton. deal. And then they have the Ramel Keaton throw, and all of a mm-hmm. sudden they score right at the end of the half. Tennessee scores the open second half. It's a total different ball game, Rob. Big part of this game is, is what happens right around the half. Yeah, I don't know if you can say one's more important than the other, but if you – if you do screw up the first quarter, you can make up for it in, in the middle eight. And if you have a strong first quarter and you back that up with a strong middle eight, then you know, you're, you're in a great spot. But I, did, I mean, to, to your point about, I think one of the reasons Tennessee is so good in the middle eight or has been is, is the way Josh coaches. I and mean, he's just aggressive. He doesn't. He, he does not coach from a position of fear about you know something bad might happen. And that's that's one of the reasons I like Tennessee in this game on the road in a tough spot. Some people are kind of doubting him. He'll go in there just. Devil may care. I, I promise you, he's not thinking they haven't won there in 20 years. His guys will be playing to win. Middle eight's so important, and I, I, I couldn't agree more, especially if you receive the opening half, of the second half kickoff, you take it down to score again. Tennessee's been so good, but Austin, I'm with you. I think that first eight's critical. Offense has got to get rolling. You've got to take the crowd out of the game and show that you can score right out of the gate like you have been the last two years. We haven't seen that. I, I know Tennessee scored on its opening possession against Virginia, but then it was crickets from there on after until, until you know, late second quarter. Middle eight's always important. I'll say first eight, though. Middle eight, first eight, just come to play for all 48, and, and Tennessee has a really good chance to go down to the swamp and get their first win since I was in college. Kane was like in middle school, and 
these guys still had great hair. Huff, Huff was on his 20th year covering the Vols. <laughs> it's also 60 I, here's, I will say this. I never covered a college football game where they only played 48 minutes. Most <laughs> I was going to say 60-minute 60 60 60 games. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm I don't, I don't remember the 48-minute games, so I'm not quite that old. I, I don't know why I'm thinking 12-minute quarters. <laughs> I think it's high school. The high school. Uh, too many high school games. Too many high school games. You're right. They're playing fun. <laughs> Five twelve minute quarters all of a sudden. <laughs> hey, you know, we all have those moments. It's the gray hair, man. My, my kids. For Eric Gain, Rob Lewis and Brent Hubbs, I'm Austin Price for the Rocky Top Roundtable.